Break Fix Podcast is all about capturing the living history of people from all over the autosphere, from wrench turners and racers to artists, authors, designers, and everything in between. Our goal is to inspire a new generation of petrol heads that wonder, how did they get that job or become that person? The road to success is paved by all of us because everyone has a story. Brace yourself, race fans, for a mind-blowing sim racing event, an adrenaline-pumping motorcycle online tournament. Our guest tonight is part of an unstoppable esports powerhouse dedicated to delivering unparalleled excitement to fans and groundbreaking sponsorship opportunities to brands alike. At In It Esports, founder and CEO Steffi Bao doesn't just settle for the ordinary. She creates extraordinary experiences by producing thrilling online competitions and real-life events that transcend the boundaries of the esports universe. And she's here with us on Break Fix to share her story and help you understand why you need to get more involved in the world of esports. And with that, let's welcome Steffi to Break Fix. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And joining me tonight is my co-host and returning BreakFix guest, founder of K53. He's part of Torque Atlanta and an esports aficionado. Let's welcome back Trevor Marks. Hello, hello. Welcome to be here. Well, Steffi, like all good BreakFix stories, there's a super heroine origin story. So let's jump into your motorsports history before we deep dive into in it, esports and your Sim for STEM program. Tell us about your motorsports journey. How did you get mixed up in all this did you come through a racing family or did you start out as a fan? So my story goes like this. So you're probably starting to hear that I have an accent. So I am from Italy. I was a little girl with the passion of motorcycle racing. Why? Because my mom and dad, they used to be fan of the sport. So they used to go and watch the world championship round every time it was coming to Italy. So basically I was born going to the track every time there was a big world championship race happening. At the age of four, my dad ended up buying a motorcycle and he was going just uh, riding in like an enduro in the trails, you know, just from the house, go and do trail riding. And every time he was coming back, you know, like from his rides, he was super happy, big smiles on his face, dirty, full of mud and whatever. And I start saying, hey, I want to do that too. So ask mom and dad, I want a motorcycle. And surely enough, instead of buying me a motorcycle that was like a, a toy, like a battery or whatever, they ended up buying me a real motorcycle. It was a mini bike. So it was like a full on dirt bike from an Italian company called Italjet. And yes, you know, like a very, very small, similar to what pit bikes are nowadays, maybe even like more like the Pee Wee from Yamaha you know, the Wee 50. So a 50cc bike with all the gear and everything, and they put me on it, <laughs> you know. There was a cone field in front of the house. They told me like, right hand is the throttle, left hand is the brake, and here I go. So for a couple of years, I started practicing around in the field, doing figure eights. Everybody that knows dirt bike or motorcycle, you understand what figure eights are, you know, like and you continue to do it over and over to learning about cornering. When I was six years old, what happened was that my dad, in one of his trips that he was out and about riding, he figured out that there was a small track with other kids who were participating. He shoots back home and says to me, get dressed, get ready. We're going to go there because there are other kids that they are racing motorcycle like you do. Up to that point, again, my mom and dad, they were just fans of the sport. So they thought the motocross was only for adults. So they were completely like, oh my God, this also racing for kids. So it was a revelation. We went to this little track. I was following my dad in the trails, you know, me with my little motorcycle, him with his. I arrived at the track and then he said, hey, go in. This is the direction. Have fun. In about one hour time, I was beating all the little boys in the track. So the family there looked at my dad and say, hey, where are you guys coming from? And my dad said, well, we live like six kilometers down the road. We just came up, you know, like experienced this. So we basically learned that they were racing for little kids. We did a proper, you know, licensing or whatever in Italy to be able to do that. Go to my first race. The first race in my life, I finished third among little boys. After that, that year, I won every races I entered. So... 
you know, I was completely like, yeah, I like this. I wanted to continue racing. And that's how I got involved with the motorsport as a whole. And so for our listeners, just to give them a reference point, you grew up in the Lago di Como area in the northern yes. part of Italy, you know, bordering France and Switzerland. That's not a super dense populated area like Milano or Parma no. or Modena or Bologna, where you would expect to see more motorsport, where Ferrari is, where Lamborghini is, where all the racetracks are. So what was it like racing up in the north of Italy or in south of France and south of Switzerland? Of course, uh, immediately we ended up just doing a local racing around the area. At that time, you know, it was called mini cross, so for mini bike. It was uh, very popular, you know, like the region of Lombardia, which is where Lake Como, Milan and all the other provinces are, was very popular. It had a lot of kids doing this as a sport. So, you know, we learned, you know, starting to do local and then regional events and then eventually the Italian championship. And then from there, I went over to the European Championship and I came to America and continued my career. So are you still racing bikes today? Or how long did you race bikes for? So I raced bikes until I was 28 years old when I had a career-ending injury. It's okay because it happens, you know, motorsport is not easy on you. And sometimes you're lucky, you only have a few injuries and you can still be okay. Sometimes it becomes difficult. In my case, unfortunately, I came up short on a big double jump. Yes, both of my ankle exploded and they wanted to amputate my legs. So I have my legs. I can walk, but I don't race anymore. I don't own a motorcycle because I know that my brain will be like, wanted to twist that throttle like I used to. So I purposely don't own it. But every once in a while, if there is an occasion, yes, I just hop on and do a couple laps here and there. So did you own street bikes as well? No, actually, especially when I came in the United States, that I had my first contract with Kawasaki and my second contract with Honda. In my contract, they said that I was not allowed to ride on the street. Because this being like an investment for the brand to have me racing for them and represent them in the various championships around the world, it became kind of like, hey, in the street, you know, it's not so much about me and my skill. They, of course, proven over and over again that there is no issue there. But it's more like about the cars. That they don't see you. So now never been a fan of going on the street. But I did race road racing when I was back in Italy. So I ended up racing in Misano, in Mugello, Monza, Imola, and all of those, you know, back in the days. And I decided to do it. I was about 17 years old when I doubled down and did the motocross and road racing that year. Just because, you know, like I wanted to try something different than the dirt. And I can tell you, though, my best performance in on road racing was when it was wet. Because at that point, the bikes were like shaking all around. So it was more of my familiar territory, you know, they're going just on a straight line and hitting the marks. You opened a great opportunity for an additional pit stop question. You mentioned you were sponsored by Kawasaki and by Honda. So if money was no object, what kind of bike would you buy? For me, like since I was a very little girl, you know, and looking at America Supercross, the teams they were winning was the Honda. A canal is still embedded in me, the Honda is the choice but I think it is because it comes from when I was little you know and when I had this dream that I looked at my mom and dad in the eyes and say one day I will race supercross in the United States of America this I was six years old so you can imagine you know like the look in the face of my parents are like yes kiddo go out and play <laughs> right but I ended up doing it and like one thing that is very rewarding that comes back full circle is the fact that, that those guys they were on my wall when I was a little girl I got got to be part of this industry and I have their cell phone number. They respect me, you know, and a little girl coming from a small town in Italy near Lake Como had a dream and just went for it. I expect her to say a Ducati. Yeah, I, I was thinking about my motor, but, you know. Or an Aprilia or something, right? Yeah. No, it's, it's because it's motocross, you know, like a Ducati yeah. just made the motocross bike. Just now. My heart has always been more into in dirt bike, but I have to say, when I raced that year in the road racing circle in Italy, I was on board of an Aprilia. So here you okay, have it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so as a comparison, did you ever turn laps in a car on a road racing circuit so you could have an idea what it was like to race the bike and race a car? So what happened to me was this. So when I was in the United States, you know, and I started to be kind of like on top of my game here, I was lucky enough to be invited to participate in a TV show made by USA Channel. So those were the early 2000s. So this show was supposed to be the idea around it was to pick different female sport of extreme sport 
sports and make them do another extreme sports. So I did two episodes of them. One was skydiving and I loved it. You know, like first jump tandem, second jump solo. Crazy, you know, but extreme sport athlete, of course, I go for it. But the second one was I drove an IndyCar. With that, you know, back in Las Vegas, there was actually, I just learned this not too long ago, the Derek Daly was the guy that had this in Las Vegas back in the days. It's funny that everything comes full circle, as we know in the industry, because now I work with his niece, Nikki Daly, in one of our programs. So it's funny, like how everything works. But yes, so I drove in the car and by doing the circuit, yes, road racing and car racing at the end, you know, the racing line is still the same. It's just that when one of you're sitting, the other one, you just have a lot of wind against you. Well, you had my attention at Mugello. <laughs> it is a favorite base there in the Florence area for those that don't know where it is. Then you mentioned Imola. So I have a question and I know it's probably the most infamous turn in all of racing. Yes. What's Tamburello like on a motorcycle? Everything on a motorcycle is definitely much more dangerous feeling than in the car, <laughs> you know, no matter of how you want to present it, you have nothing to protect you. So if you crash, it, it's going to hurt, you know. It is just like racing in general. It's just amazing. I grew up doing that. So like any track, anywhere, if I get an opportunity, I was always like, yep, let's do this. So Tamburello or the Monza Wall or whatever, you know, like, let's go and let's do it. <laughs> so this comes up a lot on the four-wheeled side of the house. Who is the GOAT? Who is the greatest of all time? And we immediately go to Formula One and it becomes this Senna versus Schumacher and Hamilton and Verstappen discussion and it just all kind of spirals. But when you turn your focus to motorcycles uh -huh. and there's one name that comes to mind and I want to yeah. see if you agree or not. Is it Rossi? Well, yes. Yes. So for road racing is Rossi. I think he won 10 world title, nine or 10 world title, but it really changed the interaction with the sport. So mm -hmm. he was really like an actor, you know, <laughs> in a way. So by doing that, all the young kids wanted to be right now influencer. He was the original influencer by acting in the way they act, you know, like, I mean, it comes from a family that is like that too. Because I don't know if you guys know, but his dad used to go around with a paddock with a chicken on a leash. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like, that's his dad. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, so it runs in the family. It runs in the family, you know. Yeah. So it's kind of like this environment, but like definitely Valentin Rose was able to do for the sport. And I think Mark Marcus was destined to follow. Correct. But then, you know, like with a lot of injuries, you know, he's still like an amazing, talented guy. But of course, the injury kind of like put a little bit of a wrench into Some his, people blame uh, Honda for all of that, but we don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, like he's doing good with Ducati right now. Yeah. But if we are talking about door bike, you have different category because you have the American reality and then the, you have the world championship that goes everywhere. Sometimes it comes to America, but right. you know, it's like that. So for the world championship, you have generational talent. Right. They used to be like when I was younger, Stefan Evers was amazing. He won 10 world title. Then of course, Antonio Cairoli amazing he won nine world titles so like right. the next generation and now you know in supercross and motocross you had the jeremy mcgrath the king of supercross yep. you know like uh, ricky carmichael baba stewart baba stewart man <sighs> and motocross and now you know jet lawrence you know, mm -hmm. Jet Lauren is a 20 years old kid. There's seven years that does not lose a championship. Right. So, you know, his goal is to have more win than Jeremy McGrath. And he has the potential to do that. So, you know, there are those generational talent that change the sport. And it's just amazing to see. So the way you describe that lets me draw a parallel between Supercross Motocross and WRC. Because if you think uh -huh. about the dynasties that exist right. in WRC, they're very, very similar. It's a very similar concept this uh, generational talent that they change the sport it's just amazing to witness i believe that if you are arriving second you don't like that much but it is needed to change the sport i like to think and i've been told that i'm one of those for the women you know i've been called the goat you know, like you're the Michel Mouton. Yes, of Super yeah, exactly. yeah, yes. But then, you know, now there are other girls, you know, like there is a, in motocross, for instance, there is this young lady from the Netherlands. Her name is Lotte van Drunen. She is amazing. But why? If she's the first year that she's doing the full on women championship, she's already leading the championship. But why? Because she raced with the boys. Because she raised the, her whole career with the boys, same equipment in there with the boys. So now, you know, like uh, competing with the girls, she is a little bit of a step up compared to them. I mean, 
amazing girl and amazing talent, but you can see the difference, which is what we need to, to accomplish by continuing having the women series and then get the women to compete with the boys. And then you see that pathway to participation. You raced for over 20 years professionally. And so yes. how did that lead to the world of esports? What happened in between <laughs> and guide us into the inception of what you're doing now? Yes. So of course, you know, like I've been one of the few women that was able to break the glass ceiling in motorcycle racing and therefore open opportunity for more other girls. I always have that desire to figure it out ways how we can have motorsport two or four wheel as opportunity to bring more female into the industry. That doesn't necessarily mean as athlete per se, but it could be also part of the industry as a whole. So I was in Italy in 2020 before the world changed. Up to that point, uh, my journey into esport was only in the fact that, that I was featuring two video games as a character when I used to be a racer. So up to that point, that was my involvement with the industry. But I was in Italy and my niece at the time, I noticed that she was watching people playing video games for two, three hours a day. So that got me going and I'm like, wait a second, maybe, you know, like a sim racing could be a potential way to create a pathway to participation for women in motorsport. We all knew like at, the, at that point, pandemic happened, all sport closed down. So Formula One was king, utilizing sim racing as an opportunity to continue to have fun, you know, like engage with the audience and so on and so forth. So it just happened at the right time. So I study a lot, I learn a ton, and then I quickly discovered discovered that there was no one putting effort for women. So at that point, I created Init Sport with the goal of my two passions. One pillar is motorcycle e-sport racing, and the other pillar is uh, sim racing focusing on women. Esports in general is huge, and it can be subdivided as Trevor and I have talked about many times before. You know, are you first-person shooters? Is it iRacing? Is it this? Is it that? But I feel like motorcycles don't get as much representation in the sim world. I can only think of a couple titles in my head, and let's put the arcade ones like Road Rash and those things to the side, you know, there's Ride and there's some other titles out there, but there's not that many. So you've managed to create an entire esports series around motorcycles and motocross. So how does that work? <laughs> so again, I study a lot and I figured it out what was on the market in regards to games. And just like you touch point there, there are the arcade games, but there are a couple games in the market right now. They are pure simulator game. So those games are exactly the same how iRacing or Assetto Corsa Competition work, meaning like they are meant to have the same physique of a real motorcycle and therefore they target gamers that they have a knowledge of what racing is about. With that in mind, I started to create the partnership with the publisher of those kind of games. And then because I come from the motorsport industry as a whole, for me, it was just like a few phone calls and try to say to different federation and to big threshold in the motorcycle industry, hey, there is an opportunity here to bring the young demographic into the industry by leveraging gaming. So with that, we ended up creating the first ever ECMA eSport event, ECMA for the people that they don't know, it's the number one trade show for motorcycle in the world. In 2024 is the 110th year that this show is going on in Italy. And there are brands from all over the world that go there, mostly, you know, to show product to everybody, talk about the motorcycle coming out for the new year and so on and so forth. So just like motorsport in four wheel, two wheel racing needs more kids. So when we talk to them in regards to the opportunity, hey, we can bring a new demographic here, it was just a no-brainer. So in four days that we did the event there, we got 4,000 people through our event, and we ended up having those two competitions. One that was for gaming specifically. So we basically opened up a sign-up online to compete. We got 10,000 people to download the game to compete in this championship where the top 40 were uh, competing for four races in a row. And then the top 10 in that championship, we brought them to the event in ECMA in Milan for the grand finale. And these are the gods of this game, you know, like, because if you see them playing, they're like, how it can even be possible, <laughs> you know? But we know that it works like that in real racing too, right? You know, like mm -hmm. if Verstappen or Hamilton, people will say, how is it even possible, <laughs> you know? So it works the 
same way, but they did this and it was uh, incredibly successful. But then we came up with another event there, we called the VAP event, where we were able to have the top three of the finale of the motocross game on MX by to race the very next day on simulator with a pickup truck with Danny Pedrosa, Antonio Cairoli, David Bulega, and all of this kind of like a legend of the motorcycle two wheels world. And it was like magic in the works because whereas we got Danny Pedrosa to win the race on the pickup truck, one of the gamer got third overall. So it was super good to see, you know, like that now stellar people, they have had success, you know, in their industry as a racer. They were right there competing, you know, with kids that they may otherwise would never even have a chance to even meet them, let alone, you know, compete against them on a video game. Right. What's your sim of choice? What do you like to drive on? I don't drive on the sim. <laughs> I'm too busy running a company, you know, and try to, to change the world. I've seen you in the sim. I've seen you in the sim a couple of times. This might sound funny, but I'm mostly in the sim to discover if a potential game can be part of the movement. Mm. <laughs> so I try the game, I'll see it, you know, like, and then we can discuss it about creating possible partnership or whatnot. Now, I really like it for me, you know me travel i work with everybody because i do believe that every company out there has the same mission the industry is big enough that we don't do one specific sim only so we like to give opportunities to everybody and you know sometimes it's one cockpit sometimes it's a different cockpit you know like and i think also that helps you know like bring back feedback to the same companies to learn if there is updates that can be made to kind of target a little bit more the female audience you know so so it's important for us to be able to use different opportunity to kind of help the industry grow. We know about how important simulator and what equipment that we use for car simulation. What does that look like for motorcycles? Is it controllers? Are there other simulator rigs? I mean, I know things have progressed a lot since your career. What does that look like now for someone that's competing at the highest level? As of right now, everybody still competing on controllers, you mm-hmm. know, with PCs. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like, because I'm very much involved in this, I'm talking with lots of suppliers to figure out ways to create something that will give the feeling of a simulator. Because for anybody that ever rode a motorcycle, you will know, you know, that it's very difficult to be able to reproduce, Mm -hmm. like, the G-force of a corner or even the sensation of doing a triple jump in Mm -hmm. in Supercross, right? But we are getting there, mostly in a way that uh, at least how my company is looking into this and provide. Uh, suggestion to hardware company is to make it in a way that it is affordable because again you know the key is there there is some opportunity out there but they are hundred thousand dollars and a kid cannot spend a one hundred thousand dollar to have no. a simulator in their bedroom right you know those are more like for training purposes much more similar to what you will see like a Dallara for uh, the real car simulator so they are meant with that concept in mind but like if we wanted to bring more kids toward the sport again that being two or four wheels you need to do it in the way that it's accessible so we are working on it so there is going to be something happening by the end of the year so just stay tuned awesome that's great Mm -hmm. and that's a special situation too because you're dealing specifically with a discipline within motorcycle racing which is motocross you know we're talking about gear here for a moment and i want to pull on a thread because i recently took my daughters to an arcade and they glommed on to these road racing arcade machines over there and you get on a physical bike and you lean it over and you use the throttle and the brake and these kinds of things so that seems to exist for the road racing side of motorcycles is that ever going to translate? I mean, those are big apparatuses, to your yes. point. It's not really going to fit in the bedroom. Mm-mm. Maybe some thoughts on what that might look like? I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a insight information on that. So if you're going to use a simulator, like arcade-style simulator for road racing, most of the people that want to really go fast, what will they will do is put both feet on the ground and move the bike side by side. So that's not racing. That's not a simulator. You know what I mean? So the purpose is like appealing to the eye, but it doesn't do what we are trying to make happen. That's why those are not really applicable to esports as a whole. What we are trying to create is something that it will give somewhat the feeling of uh, grabbing a handlebar, but then having the opportunity to be integrated like perhaps with VR. 
with VR technology, then at that point, you can trick the brain to feel like that even though you are not really moving that much, your brain thinks that you are. And then you can apply that on dirt bike games and road bike games. Since you're talking about opening up the sim racing world to motorcyclists and making it more accessible, how has sim racing changed motorsports and racing in motorsports? To me, the 2020 pandemic is actually what spearheaded like the movement to new heights. I mean, sim racing is a very great opportunity to enter the sport with a fraction of the cost. Mm -hmm. It will never substitute go-karting. And every time, you know, like we speak about this... I think everybody's aligned on that. You know, like it's not the esport and sim racing will take away go karting. No, that's not possible. But it is an addition to discover talent because even go karting per se, we know there is just a category of people that tend to have the funding to be part of that. Correct. With sim racing, by lowering the barrier of entry, now you give the opportunity to many more people for every background, every gender, you know, every ethnicity to be able to give it a try. So so that's what is important, I feel, about sim racing. And for us in particular, Travel, you already know, we really yeah. focus on the girls because mm -hmm. it's never been done before. And we speak on a way of authenticity. You know, like our right. team face forward is always women. We are proud to say this for women by women because we understand that community. We work with them. We have created a safe space where, uh, you know, like these participants are in there. We support them. And thanks to the opportunity in the industry that we are able to provide, we are continuing to open that doors, which mm -hmm. then at the end, motorsport as a whole wins. Absolutely. And one of the things that we've seen, and I'm sure you've seen this as well during the iRacing series, is that they had that moment where the drivers were cooling their tires on the grass and then coming over into... Now, I did see a driver doing that in like a GT3 class at some point in real life, which is the risk reward there is crazy. But have you seen sim racers learning bad habits? Because there's like an iRacing line and a driving. Right. There's things you can do where you're super competitive online. But if I put you in that real car, that's not a feasible move. You can't Correct. really go for that gap. You can't really take the curbs that hard. And the reason why is because it hurts. If you're in a formula car and you take a curb on some of these turns, it's going to hurt. Have you seen that? And how is that going to impact the sim racing motorsports ecosystem moving forward? Everyone is going to try anything in their power to win, <laughs> no matter what. Right. Because that's the, the sense of racing, right? Correct. I mean, I think it was last year or maybe a couple of years ago, there was a professional race car driver that took the racing line. So he rode the wall. Yes. In NASCAR. Right? Mm -hmm. In NASCAR. And that was an absolute video game move, 100%. 100%. Banned to hell now. Absolutely do not do it again. I know. But he got in with it. But this is the point, right? You know, yeah. the point. Yeah. Like, you will do anything <laughs> and everything in life to get that little advantage. Just Correct. So you know, like uh, if you had tried in eye racing and like, hey, I'm crazy enough, you know, I want it bad enough, <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm going to try it on a real racing, then it's going to happen. And then, of course, all the organization, like everything, if you do it once and it's not good, then you create the rules that you cannot Correct. do it anymore. In a way, I feel it goes both ways. You know, people are going to always try anything, you know, they can. It's good to see that in, uh, at least in digital racing, so in eye racing and all of the sim racing, you don't have the risk to get hurt so right. that's the point there and in real life depends how crazy you are i guess <laughs> how bad you want it <laughs> but isn't that what we judge the quality of the sims on especially if we come from the racing world how good they are or how realistic they are so for me and maybe i'm a purist it annoys me if you can get away with doing something that isn't feasible in real life. And I watch some of these other racers or I look at some of the ghost files, you know, even in Assetto Corsa or some of the other things that I run. And it's just like, that's impossible. I've driven this track in real life. You can't do that. And you watch their replay and it's like, how does the system even allow it? So when you guys are judging the competition, you mentioned the rules change, but do you take that into account? Like that isn't humanly possible and that weighs against the sim racers. So there's that risk reward there. When you create a sim racing competition, you put out a lot of rules for participants. So they know beforehand, you know, what the expectation is. So even that, for instance, you know, like we run most of the time tight racing where a contact is not allowed because that's the same thing in racing. You cannot just go out there and put somebody on 
on the wall just for the fun of it. So you kind of like try really much to mimic the in real racing world. But then again, it's a digital environment. As you were saying earlier, you're not going to feel the G-force. So, you know, like if you are able to keep the car somehow on the track by doing something that you think that is impossible to do in real life, they're going to try to do it no matter what. And I can tell you that, you know, there are some people out there, they are so good in digital environment that it just blows your mind away. You're just thinking, just like you said, it's not possible. I cannot believe that this is possible, but I witnessed more than one time than doing it in real life on a simulator, you look at them and you look what they're doing on the screen and it's like, well, they are doing it, <laughs> you know? But we also have seen, let's say, movies highlight this yes. transition from digital to the real world. Let's take the Gran Turismo movie as, as a mm-hmm. prime example. So has that happened in the two-wheeled world, in motorcycles, where someone has gone from digital and gone in real life? What has their feedback been? In motorcycle, it's not been done yet. It's one of my tasks, you know, that I wanted to achieve. Again, for the nature of motorcycle, it doesn't really translate that much compared to what it is on the sim. We wanted to create opportunities where we can get the best sim racing on motorcycles to take classes eventually, unless they're already a racer, then, you know, they're already a racer. But if they are not, to take classes to be able to bring them into the industry in a smart way. So that's the progression. But you're never going to be William Byron that, you know, wins a sim racing motorcycle event and then go out and win a supercross event. There's no chance. It's not possible that way. But again, it's possible to create a pathway to participation. But I also want to bring out, because you said about the Gran Turismo movie, we did something for that for girls. The screen to speed original, you know, was exactly that. So we had um, competition and travel was part of it. So you Mm -hmm. witness it. We create this online competition. Girls from all over the world sign up, participate online. And then uh, the top 20, the best of this qualification, we brought them to Las Vegas during the NASCAR Penzo 400 event. And not only they were like uh, there when the race was happening around them. Imagine, you know, the scenario. But the winner did not even have a, a driving license. And we brought her back, you know, like to test in a real Porsche 911 cup car. And her performance was like mind-blowing. So exactly the same effect of a Gran Turismo. And we are using that to be able to now link opportunities through the movement to eventually discover talent even for the F1 Academy. So mm-hmm. continue to dig deeper within the, the community of eSport. But also, we're going to get to that. But like with the Sim for STEM program that goes in school, it's all about trying to to discover talent, give them chances when they are young, take them by hand and say, hey, this is an opportunity for you, starting from sim and then having the door open to potentially go into a real race car. Do you see the future for sim racing being more screen to speed programs and more of a pipeline being built out? Or how do you see this relationship with sim racing and motorsports evolving? I think it goes end in end because what we've been saying, right? It's a way to get the sport in front of people that maybe otherwise will never try it. So it would be a no-brainer in my opinion if it just stays separate one from the other. We have proven more and more that there is the pathway to participation and I see that it's going to continue to evolve that way. Brands are going to start looking more and more into sim racer than putting them in go-karting or like in mini cars or whatever it is. And again, for us, we are the original for the women and we do have the community and it's been very rewarding to see and discover this talent from all over the world and create this environment that it's for them, it's a safe space. We are there with a sense of women supporting women to be arm in arm with each other. So if that one will step out and compete Maybe one day in Formula One, she will know that there is an army of other girls that we have created behind her there to support. I believe it's Formula Two. There's no power steering, right? Correct. I don't know what I was watching. Some type of series, women in racing. There was someone of authority in racing was saying that they need to add power steering for women because they're not strong enough to do it. I have friends that are MMA fighters that are women. I have friends that are boxers. I really strongly take offense to that. The idea that a woman is not strong enough or cannot gain the strength necessary to turn the wheel because she's going to have to gain the strength to keep her head up as you deal with the G-forces. And this is women talking about how this needs to be brought down. So what is your opinion on that? In Formula One car, you have steering assistant. So therefore, if a woman is in a Formula One car, 
should drive with the steering assistance. Mm -hmm. But if they are in Formula 2 or in Formula 4, they should drive exactly the same that the guys drive. So like same equipment is incredibly important to continue to tell the story that mm -hmm. women belong there. So if you start messing with the equipment, then it, it becomes not a good opportunity to compare Apple to Apple, right? Mm -hmm. The thing that I wish will happen is like that the Formula 1 Academy, instead of driving with Formula 4 car, they will drive Formula 1 car among themselves. Mm. They have testing car. All of these teams, they can have testing cars. They have two for each driver during the races. They can have testing car and have a woman on that. Now you're talking the same. Now it's apple to apple. But like having the girls in the Formula 4 car and then putting them alongside the Miami GP with the Formula 1 car, of course the girls are going to look silly. You know, like it's much slower. Those cars are silly compared to Formula One car. Yeah. And I guarantee you, each and every one of these girls, if you give them the opportunity to be in a Formula One car and compete amongst themselves, they will sign their life away right now and say, put me in. 100%. And as I was saying a little bit ago, like motocross, that's my sport. That's exactly mm -hmm. how it happens. There is the Women World Motocross Championship that rides on 250 or stroke machine. Right. Exactly the same of the MX2 World Championship with men. What that creates is like equal level. So now you can really compare Apple to Apple. Right. Lap times and performance. It's the same. It's the same right. track, the same equipment. So now it's like, and motocross is a little bit harder than drive cars. I'm sorry, but the physicality on a dirt bike, it's a little bit harder, you know, like than being a car. I'm with you on that. So did they do balance of performance then? Because obviously weight plays in. No, no, you do it the same. But I can also tell you this, a very good motocross rider right now, you know, but even like 20 years ago when I was racing, mm -hmm. you don't use brute force. You don't. You use physics. Right. You use physics and leverage. That is why I was able to compete with the best men in the world. Because even though I'm not strong like a man at the top of their fitness level. Doesn't matter. Me being at the top of my fitness level. I was not strong like them, but was able to compete with them. Mm -hmm. Given not at the level to win a Supercross World Championship, but I can hold my place there. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it was the same equipment right so like i guarantee you like if we have women that have the opportunity i think more than equal is trying to create that too you know like if we can have women with the same equipment of men and give them the same amount of time on the equipment as men you will find that formula one driver for women guaranteed and also like looking in the other way abby pulling they got to win the, the formula one f1 academy in miami just race with the same type of car the F4 in the UK and guess what she won the race against the men point proven so it has to be the same equipment so all of this conversation you know they just stay where they are unless there is the same equipment you know everybody can say whatever they want but until you compare apple to apple now given that that's a huge goal to get the first female into formula one what are the problems that we have in sim racing as a whole that we have to overcome like there's still a cost barrier how does that compare to in real life motorsports what do we have to work on together as people that are in this industry for me the key is media attention in real life and in mm. sim racing coming as a former professional racer and talking about the women's side of things there is not enough media attention media attention on sim racing as a whole on sim racing but also on female drivers as a whole women motorsports and sim in general right there is not enough attention brought to them so like we live in the world that the visual it's important so we always say Lindsay and james say that often too if you can see her you can be her so we need to show those women, those girls. So, so then somebody else is going to believe, oh, I can do that too. And then it continues to grow. But we are seeing this in sport in general. Everybody knows about Kathleen Clark right now. Right. Because she's not only a great athlete, but she's getting a ton of media attention. Same thing would happen with soccer, okay, with the revolution of this women's soccer war. Why they got that popular? Not only because they were good, but because media start following them. That's the key. And in motorsport, we never had it. And if we have had it, and this I spin on my skin too, it's just like that decade or that four or five years that she's on top of it, everybody talks about her. And then there is no pathway to follow. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what we are creating, a pathway 
of participation to have more and more women, that superstar stop racing. There is another one we can put there. And then the next year, it might be two we can put there. And then in the year follow three, we can put there. And if one fall up, there is another one that come up. So exactly the same our work in men racing. You mentioned earlier, Lynn St. James, do you work with Wimna? Yes. So I'm part of Wimna. Yes, I'm inside of Wimna. And, uh, you know, it was launched a couple of years ago. And actually, it was Beth Pereira that she invited me to be part of the group. So, of course, I know Lynn, you know, respect Lynn and, and everybody in that group at all. And I'm in there, you know, with the sim racing aspect. And it's still a little bit a young concept, let's say, for the group. You know, like hopefully little by little, they're going to start to understand it a little bit better in some ways. I mean, they're getting wrapped into some stuff, but everybody has their own way, you know, to present things and we'll see what happens. But I'm part of the group. So I'm in the working group of women. And I think you've stepped into something that we've talked about before. It's the special nature of motorsports as a whole. And what I'm getting at is it's probably one of the most diverse sports hands down across all sports that exist, whether you recognize motorsport as a sport or not. So I understand the arguments for men's basketball versus women's basketball. And sometimes I'm like, I don't understand why these sports aren't co-ed. But in the case of motorsport, it's a level playing field. So the question becomes, how do we bring yes. more people in and make it more diverse? My solution is how I explain it. You know, it is exactly by create representation. But for women specifically, I'm a woman in this male-dominated industry, I can tell you that, yes, it is true. Behind the steering wheel with the helmet on, everybody is the same. But there is not enough women that we can continue to put out there for team to say, yes, we're going to put a 50-50 grid on the racetrack. Correct. To be able to achieve that 50-50 grid, we need to have the army. Otherwise, it will never happen. So we are deconstructing the problem by figuring it out, you know, like I want to have 10,000 little girls that want to do sim racing and then 100,000 little girls that want to do sim racing and then move them into go-karting and then move them into something else. And now you're starting having the number. Other countries taught us this. The Netherlands, they decide to do field hockey in every school in the Netherlands. They started focusing on that sport. Now, the Netherlands has so many young little girls that play field hockey that they've been like the world champion in the Olympic for years and years and years and years. But why? Because they have the feeding. So right. that's what we need to create. And then once we have that feeding, then that argument that everybody's the same is going to completely go away because you have the number, then, then it's just class. Right now, what happens is that if you have just one sensational athlete, they are going to sensationalize her and that's it. Now you have brands that they wanted to invest, but they have as many brands that they are like, yeah, but there is no scalability. It's a similar problem to traditional esports when you're talking to any minority group about why we don't have more reputations for them. And the question is, how many people need to play Counter-Strike to get one pro? How many people need to sim race and cart to get one Formula One driver? It's like a million people. You need a million people to get one Formula One driver. You need a million people to get one Counter-Strike boy. So I can understand how you're feeding that ecosystem to get that million girls, to get that one Formula One driver, that one IndyCar champion, Correct. that one NASCAR champion. But I think it goes back to something you said earlier, Steffi, about media coverage. If you look at it on the global scale, there's going to be certain racing bodies, be it Formula One, be it World Rally, whether it's WEC, IMSA, Superbike, all that kind of stuff. There are the bastions that we look up to. They're the, like, the pinnacle of racing in those disciplines. I've no Notice, though, on a more grassroots level, especially in the United States, I went to an expo recently for sprint car and dirt track racing. There were more female drivers, especially young women drivers, in that discipline of motorsport than I'd ever seen anywhere else. It felt really just normal. It felt super comfortable. It wasn't like we're placating to these ideas. It was like, there's a lot of women in this. How do we shine a light on that? How do we then grow and blossom that and maybe get get the bigger motorsports disciplines to kind of turn their head and go, we need to do what they're doing in USAC or they're doing, you know, over here or yeah. over there. So it's a very complicated problem. You know, like I leave this, you know, like it's me being a former racer. So you have a few things going on. Usually once a, a kids hit the teenage years, 
there is no difference. You find it more often than not is 50-50, you know, in whatever sport. And you can see that in this small category of racing too. They are competitive, but nobody expects you to become Lewis Hamilton. It's more fun, it's family, whatever. Then there is a very interesting study that came from a university in the UK. They share when we lose the girl. Pay attention to this. So in the teenage year, when you start eating puberty and you start realizing different things in the world, if you have a situation where a boy fail on doing anything, it's not just about motorsport, like a boy fails, what happens is that the peer group around that boy, 99% of the time, the answer is to that boy, come on, get up, do it again. I don't want to hear it, get up, do it again. And this is documented, like it's a study. If a girl fail, especially if she's trying to do something in a male-dominated industry, therefore it's going to be surrounded mostly by male, the majority of the answer is, oh, sweetie, it's okay, you tried. So what does that do in the brain of that girl? They're going to be like, hell no, I'm not going to do that ever again. You know, I don't want to be confronted to this reality. I'm just stay aside and I'm going to go do something else, you know, without confronting myself. Because we know this, one of the things that we are doing by saying for women by women is that we can go to that teenage girl and say, I don't want to hear it. Get up and do it again. Because I'm a female, you know, I can go to her and say that. So we are trying to change the narrative in that way. So it is important to see those things because it's at that age that we can create individuals that then grow up seeing the world that there is no differences. So this is what we are doing with the racing, the same for STEM. What we're doing with the movement from screen to speed is trying to tell that story, you know, and make everybody feel like, of course, there is no difference. We are all treating the same. I can get up and do it again. So that's one important part that sometimes is forgotten because it's part of human nature. There is going to be the Steffi out there, like there is the Jamie Chadwick out there. Even if they say, hey, sweetie, it's okay. I'm like, you say it is okay? Let me show you. You know, you know, like there is not enough because it's the culture that we live in, because there is always the father figure that wants to protect the little girl. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's just that we need to kind of like change a little bit the narrative and say, no, you are capable to do anything you want you know, in this world. And another thing to unpack the question that you put out there is for me, it's like we need to do way more the model that Extreme E is doing. So one male, one female, at least to generalize like this, then one day, okay, it's going to be non-binary, whatever, it's all good. But right now to be able to give the same media attention, that's the way. And in fact, you know, the young demographic is very much attracted to what's happening with Extreme E. If you look and you talk to the young one, that's what they look up. They say, oh, I can have my teammate, you know, like, and it's a woman or a boy to compete with me. The ER1 series, the boat series, copying the same model. So I think that's the future. If we can start to do that more and more, then we started to get the balance. But it takes a village because the cultural effort, the way that we are brought up thinking, and also the fact that there are a lot of brands don't want to take the risk. Somebody told me that there will never be a Formula One or an Indy 500 car woman compete at the highest level because the industry is scared of her dying in an accident. Mm. And I'm like, well, a woman and a man body is the same, you know, like a man can die like a woman can die. Yeah, but culturally, women and children first. When women get killed, it's a big exactly. problem. Exactly. So if that's got your logo on there, it's a way bigger deal. The contrapositive to that is that men are disposable, women are not. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's a huge hurdle right. to have to culturally overcome. But that's not the truth, though. Like we are all human beings. Mm -hmm. So there is no difference, really, you know, like mm -hmm. especially in sport, you know, but in anything you do, right? But the only hope is like to get the young demographic to start treating equally from the very young age when they hit that puberty, then they started to, you know, the DNA working like we've been for many, many centuries now. To little by little, you know, give her the opportunity to think like that she can do it. And it goes back to the fact if you can see her, you can be her. So it goes back to the media attention. So more we can show that those girls are out there and there is other girls out there that they are doing it, more we're going to kind of tilt that needle and eventually not have ever anymore the discussion who is behind the helmet.
it doesn't matter. It's just an individual that wants to race. Steffi, you've tiptoed us across the threshold of this <laughs> next subject a couple of times. You've mentioned your SIM for STEM program. So let's talk yes. about that. How does that work? What's that all about? So the SIM for STEM program, it's an idea that came about between me and my very good friend, Nikki Daly. She's a former Olympian from uh, Ireland and her uh, uncle is Derek Daly and her cousin is Connor Daly. So she never had the opportunity to really race or be involved as a participant in motorsport, but she always been around motorsport. So she has a very similar passion on the one that I have. So she started to come up with the idea, what if we use STEM, you know, like to get the attention of girls. And me being the company that does e-sport sim racing for girls, it was just a natural opportunity to get together and create sim for STEM. So what this program does, goes into schools and put a young girl in the role of a motorsport team by using STEM activities, motorsport related. And then they apply what they learn into simulators. So now you have the racing line, you have a bunch of other things that they can actually use math to understand and then goes into the simulator and they can see results. So it becomes an experiential learning. So now schools are like, whoa, you open the Pandora box here. Because not only, you know, you meet the kids where they are online, but also you get them to do math, engineering, science, and technology in a way that is very appropriate to what they are doing every day when they play games. And using motorsport, it's a no-brainer because everybody can relate to it. Now you can have the principal of a school or a superintendent put them into a sim and they're like, oh, now I get why you want to have eSport in the schools. This is a, an opportunity. And I'm not saying that sim racing is the only way, but it's definitely a way that opens tons of possibility for eSport to become more and more popular in every school in the world, not just in the U.S. With that, though, we create the pathway. So we discover the talent. Then we can create the online school championship for girls. And then they can escalate to the screen to speed online series. So compete against girls all over the world. And then eventually, you know, we can figure out ways to put them in cars to test or go-karts, depending on the age, right? And get them to have an experience in real life. And who knows, maybe along the way, we'll do find that talent that she didn't even know that she has. Because it's all about inclusivity and for me is incredibly important. In school now, we are also running the program Mix. But the thing that we say is like, yes, you are allowed to run the program Mix, but it has to be at least 50% girls. So now it touches back to the extreme model. So now if you are a boy, of course, you're going to want to do sim racing, you know, and do math and whatever to get better. But now you're going to have to recruit the girls. Otherwise, you don't get to do it. So STEM or STEAM? Well, right now we call it STEM, but of course, you know, we can put art in there for sure. You know, like we have not explored that part yet, but it's all about building and not dividing. We are doing this. We have the passion. If, you know, like other people like David is doing too, and we got connected with him. Let's just unite the energies, you know, and try to elevate everybody together. So that's the most important thing I say. So Steffi, when you look back over your motorsports career, there aren't a ton of female motorcycle riders out there. I'm sure you know a lot of them, but you're at the pointy end of that spear. But who was somebody that you looked up to, somebody that inspired you in the motorsports world? Yeah. So when I was very little, I didn't know of any woman doing this. You know, like all of my competition when I was a young girl up to my teenager, I turned professional at 17. They were only boys. So, you know, I, I was like, oh yeah, I like to do this. I was looking up, of course, at the dream of the American Supercross racer. So all of these guys I was telling you earlier that they were on my wall, you know, like that's what I was looking up. But when I got a little bit older, like around that teenage years, I discovered, and I guess this was the age where there were no social media and internet that you can discover everything like in a split <laughs> of a second. I learned about this female athlete. Her name is Mercedes Gonzalez. And she's American. I remember still nowadays the thing that I loved. She was featured on a box of AXO booth. So every booth that was being sold worldwide, there was her image in there. And then it's like, oh man, I need to do this. I wanted to be her. And it's funny again, like the f very first time that I got to come to the United States of America to race, I was 14 years old. And guess what? I competed in this uh, international women race event in a Paris Raceway in California, where there was Mercedes. There was uh, almost toward the end of her career. So for me already, you know, be there and compete with my idol was 
incredibly like something out of this world and I have won the race. So you can imagine, you know, like how I built my confidence and continue to do what I ended up doing in life. But like, we are great friends. Her, you know, give me the opportunity to say, yeah, you are this little one now coming up, you know, like and be able to be the queen of the sport. But was respect, you know, back and forth. It's never been, you know, like any situation with anybody in the women series, like, oh, you know, like the ones, the young ones come in and so we need to keep them back now I did the same back too you know like when I was toward the end of my career I was inviting riders that I knew that they were getting to be faster than me but I was not scared that they were going to beat me because that's the evolution of the sport you know you need to help the young generation to want to continue to grow and they look at you and say you've done it before so I want to be you you know and when you turn around and say let me help you get there then it's magical so Steffi I got one more question as we wrap up this thought about sim for stem screen to speed program and all these different things that you're working on and we've sort of hinted at this the whole time and and you've said it but i want to hear your elevator pitch in a way you know a little girl walks up to you in the paddock and says steffi why should i race what do you say to them? Well, if they come up to me and say, why should I race? It's like, first of all, you're already in the paddock. So you have the bug. <laughs> you know, like, and second, let me help you get that desire where it can go. So the sky is the limit. Always go for it. So if you have a passion, that's the key though, is passion. So if you have the passion, just keep going. Ignore like the negativity because it comes. We live in a world where we are connected with everybody. Ignore that. Just keep on working hard and keep on going because sooner or later, you're going to get what you want. Just follow your passion. Well, Steffi, we've reached that part of the episode where I like to invite our guests to share any shout outs, promotions, or anything else that we didn't cover thus far. Now, you know, Dorna is putting together the championship for women in road racing. So that is going to be launched this year. There is movement, you know, in motorcycling too, you know, and I hope that by trying to get girls interested in esports, motorcycling as well, we can kind of continue to feed that system possibly get more women involved. We have the movement that is called Screen to Speed. My company's name is In It. So our tagline is Be In It. So be part of something to make a difference. So In It uh, Esport.gg you can find the championship that we're running there. You see the two category in your motorcycle and sim racing with cars. And yes, you know, like this is kind of like what we do. We do activation of course also, you know, this is part of sim racing. So if you wanted to engage, you you know, the female world or like make something that is a little bit different than everybody else, probably we are the one for you. Steffi takes pride in being part of a woman-led company, blazing a trail of diversity, equity, and inclusion. With a cutting-edge platform, they are on a mission to eradicate bullying and cheating from the esports world, ensuring a level playing field where safety and fairness reign supreme. In it Esports is here to unleash a tidal wave of excitement, pushing the boundaries of what's possible in the gaming realm and motorsports. To learn more about how you can join them as they revolutionize the motorsports and esports landscape, be sure to log on to initesports.gg or follow them on social at init underscore esports on Twitter at init esports on Facebook, Instagram, and on YouTube. And with that, Steffi, I can't thank you enough for coming on Break Fix and sharing your story with us. And I have to say, being Paisani, it's in the <laughs> DNA to be passionate yes. about motorsports as Italiani, but your passion goes beyond just the heritage and the ethnicity. It comes through in everything you're doing and the way you speak and the way you're putting this out there. And I'm excited as a father of two daughters that are yes. entrenched in the motorsport world, that there are opportunities like this for them to explore when they come of age and they're getting close to it. So we'll be looking to work with you more in the future, but I'm really excited on the foundation you've built. And I really appreciate the way you're continuing to promote motorsports enthusiasm. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you everybody for listening to my story. And I can't wait to keep providing opportunity for young girls and anybody that wants to be in this fantastic world of motorsport. Grazie. Prego. <laughs> ciao, ciao. <laughs> We hope you enjoyed another awesome episode of Break Fix Podcast brought to you by Grand Tory Motorsports. If you'd like to be a guest on the show or get involved, be sure to follow us on all social media platforms at Grand Touring Motorsports. And if you'd like to learn more about the content of this episode, be sure to check out the follow-on article at gtmotorsports.org. 
We remain a commercial free and no annual fees organization through our sponsors, but also through the generous support of our fans, families, and friends through Patreon. For as little as $2.50 a month, you can get access to more behind the scenes action, additional pit stop minisodes, and other VIP goodies, as well as keeping our team of creators fed on their strict diet of Fig Newtons, Gumby Bears, and Monster. So consider signing up for Patreon today at www.patreon.com forward slash GT Motorsports. And remember, without you, none of this would be possible.